But now here on BBC Radio 4, it's time for the Saturday drama. In 1816, the poets Byron and Shelley and the writer Mary Godwin, later Shelley's wife, spent the summer together by Lake Geneva. The summer would have many repercussions for them, but one storytelling evening in particular was to be Mary's inspiration for the story of Frankenstein. Our Gothic imagination season continues now with bloody poetry. Howard Brenton's earthy examination of the open sexual relationships between the poets and their partners. Far, far above, piercing the infinite sky, Mont Blanc appears. Still, snowy and serene, its subject mountains, their unearthly forms, pile around it. Ice and rock, broad veils between the frozen floods, unfathomable deeps, blue as the overhanging heaven. Up. Dejected thoughts in exile. <laughs> the flight out of England, Mary, with little William and Claire. What an unholy, holy family. We little band of atheistical perverts. Free lovers, we poeticals. Leaving England. 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 Men of England. Wherefore plough for the lords who lay ye low? Wherefore weave with toil and care the rich robes your tyrants wear? Bump, bump. Bump, bump. Bump, bump. Bump, bump. The living frame that sustains my soul is sinking beneath the fierce control. Down through the lampless deep of song, I am drawn and driven along. Wave on wave. This world is the mother of all we know. This world is the mother of all we feel. <laughs> Waves. The shore of Lake Geneva. We have arrived the 25th of May, 1816. against the light. Where? The head of a god. The head of Lord Byron. It is the head of a local fisherman. I do not think the Lord Byron is out catching with his own hands what he can pay excessively to eat in a restaurant. <sighs> it was you and Bish who wanted this meeting. It was you who wished to throw yourselves at the feet of England's greatest living poet. <laughs> I knew he would come to this hotel. It was I who sat up late last night and heard his coach. Lordship's coach. It is an ostentatious vehicle. I have ridden in it. It has a bed. For two, of course. I sent him a letter at two o'clock this morning. Claire, you did not. I sent a letter to my lover, yes. Oh, Claire, my dear, my dear. I am not ashamed. No. No, you are not. I told him Bish and we were here. He did not rush to meet us at breakfast. His footman said he had gone into Geneva to shop for his dogs. For dog food. We wait ten days for him in a hotel at a ruinous price. The Olympian god of English poetry arrives, ignores us and goes to buy dog food. Oh. Mary... This is not like you to be so uneasy. I... What? I still have dreams of the journey here. The mountains were beautiful. They were desolate. Oh, we must not be dejected. No. We are privileged to make this journey. We are privileged to stand on this beach and see George Byron and Bish Shelley meet. It will be history. Well... We will all write it up in our diaries, surely, and read each other's accounts secretly. What else is there to do? 
The two poets meet on a beach. In their exile, they embrace. It will be like a statue. And I have been the lover of one and am the lover of the other. <laughs> All of us. We will become magnificent. We will find out how to live and love without fear. If the money does not run out first. Your sarcasm's horrible, Mary. I hate it. I hate it. I've never heard it before. I told you. The journey has made me cold inside. When you heard that George and I, the Lord Byron and I, had made love, your first thought was, Oh, good. Claire will arrange a meeting between Bish and him. No, sister? Did you not have at once that scheme in your notoriously strong, womanly mind? Forgive me, Claire. Yes. Yes? yes. Then keep in mind I lifted my skirt for this. For the good of English poetry. Long live poetry, yes, Mary? <sighs> he has very bad teeth. George Byron, you know. His teeth, they are not good. Claire, I do want them to meet. I want us all to meet. The attraction is too strong, a like mind. In England, they want to hang us all. Bad reviews are not good enough for our enemies. They would like a public execution. Remember what the Daily Mail called us? All too well. Shelley's ball girls. Mm. <laughs> Quote, Mr. Shelley is a bad poet. Like a bad tennis player, his verses forever smash into the net and fall to the ground. But Mr. Shelley is lucky. Two beautiful girls crouch on the sidelines, waiting to pick up his balls. <laughs> Gutter <laughs> journalism. <laughs> the real world. Damn you, Polidori. Look, he's coming. Your destiny may be to be eaten by crabs and fishes, but mine is not, sir. You are no sailor, sir. Off the Neptune, a watery trident up your arsehole, sir. Claire, my dear. My lord. No request, no word. I'm lathered horribly. This is Mrs. Mary Shelley. Mary, my lord Byron. My lord. Mrs. Shelley. And my lord this. Yes. A younger poet. Reluctant to greet me? Not at all, sir. Oh, Mr. Shelley, Shelley... What do you I... write on? I write on gin and soda water. At night till dawn. Damn important to pace yourself, I find. As the sun riseth, so doth the gin in the glass. Mr. Shelley does not drink. Not another damn word's worth. I do distrust a sober poet who writes of nothing but ecstasy. God's teeth! Bish Shelley the Wildman does not drink! What do we scribbling poets have in common? Sir, I have met this silence from fellow scribblers before. It usually means they think I am a bad poet. If that is why Miss Claremont has affected this introduction, then... My lord, you are a great poet. But you are an abominable sailor. Sir, what do you mean by that? You abandon your bark in the hands of a fool. That, that that does call for an explanation. That is my official biographer foisted upon me by John Murray, my publisher. Is Murray touching your stuff? No. No, he will, he will. Commerce, in the end, hath every talent raped up against a wall, particularly when the talent is in the throes of divorce proceedings, a predicament that I gather is familiar to both of us. I do not hold with... Polidori! Polidori! Wonderfully ludicrous name, no? Polidori! He's also my personal physician. I'm his sole patient. He's killed off all the others. <laughs> to the bottom, sir! Let the mermaids chew your bollocks off! I am... It's train hard, my lord! Are there? <laughs> my lord? Are there mermaids in lakes? If a rhyme is needed, no doubt there can be. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. I see I'm talking to a fellow professional. So you sail? Yes. Well? Yes. Excellent. You swim? Yes. Excellent. Hmm. You called me great. One is always pleased to receive a good review for 
writers in our position, a good review is as rare as a double-yoked egg at breakfast. For me, yes, but not for your lordship. The praise of critics is bought, bought and sold. It's all to do with fashion. When you have some fashionable reputation with critics, cash it in. Foist an outrage on the bastards. It may sir, come as a surprise to you that, uh, that the epithet great is contrary to my nature. <laughs> Madam? I am sure, my lord, that no one of this company is foolish enough to confuse greatness with arrogance. <laughs> I will think on that. But there is a touchstone. Shakespeare was great. I am loath even to apply it to Shakespeare, a grotesquely talented little shit in the pay of royalty. Shakespeare did not go far enough, further than any of us can go, but not far enough. King Lear himself, not Gloucester, should have been blinded. And then, in his darkness, he should have turned on God himself. But at least he wrote a great deal. The greatest sin in a poet is anal retention. Explain. I've heard of this habit that certain madmen have from the pathetic Polidori. They tighten their arseholes day and night to retain their turds, which they do for weeks. <laughs> I have heard of this too. What could release them from this infirmity is the shock of electricity. Yes, 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 but certain poets are turd retainers. When after months their bowels squeeze open, all they lay is a turd. <laughs> I have read you, sir. <laughs> I particularly admire your entry in the register of the hotel. Name, Percy Bysshe Shelley. Profession, democrat, philanthropist and atheist. Home address, hell. <laughs> I know you wrote it in Greek, but do you want to be eaten alive? Allow me, sir, to kiss your hand. My dears, dinner, dinner, dinner. Tonight, tonight. <laughs> If my biographer's body is washed up on this beach, drowned, send it back to England, suitably <laughs> decomposed. George, my dear. Dinner, Claire, dinner. Drunk. Brilliant. Brilliant. Drunk. And silly. But himself. And brutally cruel. But we have met. <laughs> yes. Now it has happened, we can make it all mythical. Quite. We met naked. At sunset. Maidens twined flowers about our hair. Yes, autographs were given to mermaids. Byron left on the back of a dolphin. <laughs> and Shelley? Ah, Shelley. Yes. Erected an electrical machine and sucked the soul of Byron into a bottle. Yes. Screwed tight, which he then did mix with a magic liquid and drink. drink. So Shelley too could have fame and money. <laughs> did you see how he did love me wonderfully? Oh, okay. oh. Oh. Ah, uh, uh, Mr. Shelley. Oh, I am. Um, I have uh, read your Queen Mab. Some of it is very well done. Uh, some of it slapdash. A critic. A critic. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. A slimy thing. Out of the slimy sea. Oh. Oh. Dr. Polidori, you are very wet, sir. Uh, madam, I. Uh, we are Mr. Shelley's concubine, sir. Mm. Indeed. <laughs> Forgive us, sir, our high spirits. At once, madam, of course. <laughs> um, though it is not advisable to cavort so on, on a public beach. No. There are tourists with spy glasses. Oh. Uh, uh, <clears throat> William Polidori. Oh, I, I, I seem to have... Oh. <laughs> Lost Lord Byron. Oh, my lord! <laughs> this damn hotel fish, we will move. I will take the Villa Diodati. The poet Milton stayed there. Perhaps the wallpaper is conducive to good verse. There is a smaller house, five minutes walk away. I suggest you all take that. Polidori here will do the business arrangements. A summer lease. Uh, no, 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 no. We will summer together. It has hit me, sir. An idea. We will all go communist. We are upper class renegades. We can afford it. Well, More tonight. Plans, plans of changing the world, of, of ripping human nature apart. Love and summer tonight. At dinner. <laughs> My lord, you abuse me. My abuse is a gift. It will enrich your diary. <laughs> I, I share his lordship's confidence, you see. I, I do share it. Anything you wish of him, ask me. M my lord! <laughs> 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 Can we afford 
a house. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> but we will. Life goes on, on, on. <laughs> <laughs>You were with him last night, up at the big house. Oh, yes. Slept with him. It is lovely this summer. It is lovely. Hmm. Have you told my Lord Byron? Have you told him you are to have his child? Claire, my dear, my darling, your mother married my father. That makes us sisters, yes? Also, we're in love with the same man. Mary, now... You deny you slept with Bish? You deny you still sleep with him? You are with him every night. Uh, but we all walk out. In the daytime, in the fields, along the shore. In an infinite combination of couples. Yes. All I want to say is that... Because of the higgledy-piggledy, jumbled, tumbled confusion of the state of our affections... I do not think I can bear to have to be your mother, too, my dear Claire. <laughs> Mary, Mary. Oh, Claire. <sighs> George Byron. He is the father of your child. Oh, yes. Oh, Yes, Mary. <laughs> Tell him. I will. Then claim the child. Oh, no. George Byron will make me his wife. I will claim him. Claire, claim the child for his or her sake, for your sake. But he will marry me. How do you know that? Because of the manner in which I oblige him. Oh, Claire. Claire. You will see tonight at dinner how his affection hath deepened. How we do trust our affections. What else can we do, all of us, in our predicament? He hath no affections. Do not speak of George in that way. No, I did not mean George Byron. Who then? A figure. Mary, what is the matter? Oh, nothing. It's silly. Silly. I'm writing the story of a monster... Very, very silly. Monster? He lives up in the snow. In the mountains. And he does not love us? No. Maybe we will summon up your monster tonight, after dinner. Or Bish will, with electricity. Or he will come of his own accord. Mary, how beautiful you are. Beautiful and strange. There was a time when meadow, grove, and stream, the earth and every common sight, to me did seem apparelled in celestial light, the glory and the freshness of a dream. It is not now as it hath been of yore, turn wheresoe'er I may, by night or day, the things which I have seen, I now can see no more. Shades of the prison house begin to close upon the growing boy, but he beholds the light, and whence it flows, he sees it in his joy. At length the man perceives it die away, and fade into the common light of day. Whither is fled the visionary gleam? Where is it now, the glory and the dream? Yes, 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 but... God's teeth, Bish, must you after every dinner dish me out these great slabs of Wordsworth? Like the slap of a cold fish in the face. It is your medicine, my lord. Oh, why? Why do you admire this dry-assed poseur's line so greatly? 
You are a publicly declared revolutionary, a communistical personality, if I ever met one, willing to share your all with all and sundry... My lord, I do not like that. <laughs> brandy, brandy, brandy talking, no offence, but... This is ridiculous. I sit here in the company of this rabid, militant personage, and he quotes England's most reactionary poet in my face. You admit the poem you quote is of defeat. Wordsworth does not think it is, but... Yes, it is a poem of defeat. You realise the poem argues that a five-year-old knows more than any 25-year-old, let alone a 35-year-old. Did Socrates talk rubbish from when he was six? <laughs> Trailing clouds of glory do we come from God who is our home. Heaven lies about us in our infancy. <laughs> Why do you not throw up? It's nonsense. I'm agnostic, but you're an atheist. It denies experience, the maturity of manhood. And womanhood. What do you what do you admire there? Feeling. Yes. Mm. Song. Oh, you defeat me. The poem's argument is wrong, but its song is true. Truer than its argument. So why is there any difficulty in singing it? Ah, ha, ha. Romanticism rears its ugly look both ways, have it both ways head. <sighs> Though something be nonsense, feel the feeling. But you have been called Europe's greatest romantic poet. Slander. It may sell books, but slander. My favourite poet is Alexander Pope. Oh, unreadable, <laughs> unspeakable, rhyming tinsel to flatter the ruling class. But honest to himself, to what he knew. So is Wordsworth in tonight's poem. Honest to himself. Are you... <laughs> no, bitch. In what you write tonight, will you be honest to yourself? <laughs> I do not know, Bish. What I write tonight will, I am afraid, write itself. I will not know its worth, let alone its honesty. But if you write tonight, you will. My dear Bish, my dear, dear Bish Shelley, true poet... God, you radical communard. I fumble a compliment to the poet among you, and I do not know if you be offended, indifferent, or, or moved. What matter? What matter? We're moved, George. We are moved. But what matter? Perhaps in the end, nothing, or everything. I, I could end up believing not this, not that, but that everything is true. Everything is true. What, what pray, is that philosophy? Uh, Liberalism. Am <laughs> <laughs> I that ill? You have symptoms, my lord. Oh, political pox, huh? <laughs> Everything is true. But for tyranny, against that I will take up the gun. I know you will. <laughs> I begin to enjoy myself greatly with you lunatics. <laughs> Claire, my dear, come. Put your arms around me. Crawling between heaven and earth. The shitty Shakespeare's line. Crawling between heaven and earth. The line's meant to be a horror, but it is strangely comforting. I do not know why. Because it sings. Ah. <laughs> I do believe I've just lost a literary argument. <laughs> Madam, last time such a thing happened to me, I... I fought a duel, pistols, dawn, a secret field, all formality. Name your weapons. Mm, rhyming couplets. Refused. Your choice. Wait. Home true. I am dead. <laughs> <laughs> I entered the drawing room of the Villa Diodati. Outside, there raged... The storm. Hmm, no. Outside, the storm raged. No. Outside, the storm abated. No, no. Ah, I was wet and miserable. 
<laughs> in a flash, I saw them. A flash of lightning. The air in the room was heavy with their illicit sexuality. They had been at it. I knew it. I knew it. No. Oh. The two great poets were, I observed, in contemplation. The women observing a discreet silence. No. The profligate would be poets and their their whores lounged upon the floor and felt disgraced at my entrance for I brought with me the wind and the rain. No. Oh. I am so lonely. Why did they assume that I am second rate when I am not? I mean, has Shelley ever had a good review in his life? And look at them. Byron is an overweight alcoholic. Shelley is an anorexic neurotic mess. And the planet is bestrewn with their abandoned children, lovers of both sexes, and wives. Shelley has tuberculosis, Byron has syphilis, and these are the men whom the intelligent among us worship as angels of freedom. No. It was a privilege to be the friend of those two young, beautiful men in the heyday of that summer. No. Yes. After all, I am paid £500 by Byron's publisher to write a diary of this summer. Dreadful time. No. Time of my life. My decent life. So... I entered the living room of the Villa Diodati that stormy night. Polly! Polly, Polly, Dolly, dear, have a brandy. Lightning! What? Over the lake! Sir, are you watery again? <laughs> that I was in it! The lake or the lightning? I was about to say that. Yes, but you did not. <laughs> a, a, a storm like that is like God. His hand from the darkness fingering his creation. You do not speak so in this company, Polly, with these free thinkers. They who believe in God go straight to hell. <laughs> I, I think the image perfectly fine. The, the fork of lightning... Shall we go out? <laughs> On the lake, tonight. Electrical experiments, Bish. Bish once flew a kite in an electrical storm with a cat tied to it. A cat? <laughs> the aim was to galvanise the animal's nervous system. I've seen this in, in madhouses in France. Uh, the jolt of electricity to, to realign the vital force through the organs of the body. <laughs> God! The idea of the cat was that the animal be transformed by natural force. <laughs> and what was the result of this advanced experiment? The cat fell in the farmyard pond and drowned. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we go? If you wish. The phosphorescence of waves may well be electrical. What if lightning link with it and flash across the water? Will you come with us, my dear? I think that on a vile night such as this, I prefer the flash of brandy along the waves of thought in the brain. The unreal to the real thing. What do you seek to imply? The shadow to the substance. So are we talking about not getting wet or... Plato's Cave. I myself have always been afraid of the story of Plato's cave. Why afraid? There is something dark, something sinister about it. But, madam, 2,000 years of philosophizing rests upon the parable of Plato's cave. It is meant to be the great statement of the predicament of mankind. Let's do it. Do it? This drawing room. Make it the cave. Ah, yes. now, house party. Oh, good game. Where is Plato's Republic? I was just... Uh, ah. Here it is. Give it to me. I will read Socrates. No, sir. Give it to me. You will read Glaucon. He says yes, Socrates, all the time. Oh, a secondary <laughs> role will do you good, George. We need the fire in the cave. Candelabra. Yes. Place them on the floor. See how their light casts shadows upon the wall. <laughs> now, we need prisoners. 
Oh. <laughs> what, what is a foot? You are to be chained, Polidori, hand, oh. head and leg, in the great cave of philosophical mystery. I persist! I... Ah. Hold him! You're going to love this, Polidori. Bish, a hand, bind him. Ah. Ah. No, please! Ah. The human condition, Doctor. Have him in rags, whipped and scourged, or at least the bag eyes. No, no, no! Ah! ah. ah. The voice of the great philosopher Socrates. In a dark cave sit prisoners. Their legs and necks are chained. So tight they cannot turn their heads. Polidori! <laughs> At last, a role in life. <laughs> Sir, deliver yourself into the hands of Percy Bysshe Shelley, this advanced experimenter, about to fly you on some metaphysical kite, sir, this very stormy night. No, no, please. I, I, I will argue philosophy, uh, but I do not wish to come to any harm. What? Let philosophy be poetry harmless, sir. Shh, the philosopher. Behind the prisoners, there is a fire. A candle, Polly. Huh? The light of the fire throws the shadows of the prisoners on the wall. What? What? what, what, what? Between the fire and the chained prisoners runs a road. <sighs> Along the road go men and animals. No. The prisoners see the shadows on the wall. Oh, Bish, with me, make the shadow of an eagle. A buzzard. A bear. But please stop. Here is a, here's a lion. Look, look. Damn me, what animal's that? A giraffe, obviously. Now tell me, can the prisoners see anything of the men on the road? Except for the shadows cast. No, Socrates. And so they would believe that the shadows and the shadows of themselves were real. Yes, Socrates, inevitably. But now, what would happen to the prisoners if they were released from their chains and cured of their delusions? They would go mad, mad, mad! You what? to the text, George. Suppose one of them were let loose, made to stand up, turn his head, and walk towards the fire. Suppose he was told that what he used to see was mere illusion. Do you not think he would be at a loss? Mad! Mad! George! <laughs> yes, Socrates. And if he looked directly at the fire, would he not be blinded? Yes, <laughs> yes, Socrates. And if he were dragged up out of the cave and saw the sun, would he not be in terror? Yes, 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 Socrates. And now I tell you, our real sun is but the fire in the cave. We are as distant as the prisoners, chained before shadows as we are from the true sun, which some call God, which I call absolute good. If I was such a prisoner, tell you what I would do. Bribe a guard for a gun, blast my way up out onto the hillside and make love with the first man, woman, boy, girl or animal in sight. Gods. That dismal parable is to date the greatest philosophical account of the condition of mankind. The world is bloody and real. And we know it. Why torment ourselves with ghosts? The fire in the cave is the past by which we see now. The sun on the hillside is the future of mankind. It is our future that is the absolute good. Plato himself was a prisoner. Religion, a flicker in the cave. The mind of man. That is the true sun. We are the instruments of that future light. You're spinning all over us, Bish. I've noticed the more abstract you visionaries become, the more all drenched in saliva. I Cannot turn my head. You fool, Polidori. I frighten I shall see. Sir, turn your head. Leave visions to the like of Mr. Shelley here. Remain in the realm of the mundane where you belong. Turn. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, I, I cannot. <laughs> there, yes. there, Polly. <laughs> what, pray, what can you do better than I when it comes down to it? 
but for writing verses. Sir, first I can hit with a pistol the keyhole of that door. Secondly, I can swim for miles in the open sea. And thirdly, I can give you a damn good thrashing. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Yeah, you... there, let me untie you. We're only playing, Doctor. It's shadows. What? Your shadow fish, see? On the wall. What if... What if a shadow that we made upon the wall of our cave stepped down, walked towards us, begged for life, and we gave it life? What would it be? <laughs> Midnight capital. Let us forget rational electrical experiments and go out to open graves. The hideous phantasm of a man stretched out. But not a man, a thing put together out of graves by unhallowed arts. Monsters. Of monsters, this is the worst. Coleridge's witch. Beneath the lamp, the lady bowed and slowly roiled her eyes around. Then drawing in her breath aloud, like one that shuddered, she unbound the cincture from beneath her breast. Her silken robe and inner vest dropped to her feet, and in full view, behold, her bosom and half her side, hideous, deformed and pale of hue. O oh, shield, a shield, sweet Christabel. Well, that is what opium doth for a poet. Doctor! Damnation, sir. I'm moving to him. Yes, yes. <laughs> A, a ruler, a rod, a stick, uh, against him biting his tongue. What in heaven's name is the matter with uh, A seizure, my lord, with this I am of some worth. But an overloading of the nerves, an excess of agitation in the fluid of the spinal cord. Sir, this pencil between your teeth, sir. I followed him into another room, calmed him, and he did confide in me. Yes, he did tell me of what he had seen. He had looked at Mrs. Shelley, and there, standing in her place, was another woman he had known, naked, with eyes in her nipples, her nipples as eyes staring at him. Is there no end to their fantasisms? to the indulgence of these revolutionary apostles with their lives falling apart, their minds in rags. But I did write my account of the evening down and had it printed in a book. It did bring me a little fame. I left them to their summer, to their diseased imaginations. I found a letter Byron had written to his sister Augusta. It was obscene. It was magnificent. Fish! For God's sake, are we going on the water? Are you falling about in another visionary fit? Coming! The things he wrote to her. Naked in your arms. No other love for me in the desolation of Europe. Desolation of my life. Dear Augusta, we have a true marriage, sealed in heaven, witnessed in hell forever. You read a copy? He had not sent it. Ah. <laughs> but it exists. It is in the world. He is a writer of fiction. Beware. Do you mean he really doesn't love her, but cares for me instead? Claire, Claire. For the daughter of writers, for the mistress of writers, you display great ignorance or misguided faith. I will overcome his affections. I will use the child. I will mould him. He will write to me as he wrote to his sister. That will be me. He is a libertine in love with life. Capital letters. They who are in love with life in that way cause only pain to those around them. 
I do suppose I am the father of, of Claire's coming little thing. I do suppose so, George. I mean, to turn the conversation man to man. You have had them both, have you not, in your time? Rest assured that you are the father of Claire Claremont's child. No, 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 don't go huffy. It's all the same to me, my dear fella. It seems to me that you are intent on populating the world with ghosts. I'm intent on populating it with Byron's bastards. Damn me, why don't I stick to boys? Are we going to sail this bloody boat, Paul? Yes! There is hope for a storm. Augusta is his distant star. In whosoever's arms he lies each night, he can look up and say, There is my true love. Not this woman, man, boy with dirty feet and night smells. If Augusta were to leave England and come to him, with all the terrible cost to her, the, the loss of reputation and scandal, he would at once betray her. Probably with you. I will tangle him. I will wrench him. Are, are we not always saying to each other, the world is yet to be made? We are changeable. We will invent a new society and a new human nature. A new human nature? Out of George Byron? My darling Claire. Tell you the sweetest thing. Love of a sister. We talk frankly. Your sister, very fine. Ever had her? Come, sir. Between the waves and us, our little lusts in a boat. We must follow our natures. What more can we do? You bloody hypocrite. Where's your legal wife, Harriet? In England. The two women you're with, Mary, you, you call your wife, Claire, your friend, concubines, sir. Mistresses, sir, all your idealism. Revolution in society, revolution in the private life, all trumpery. You damn theorizing, all you want to do is get your end away, and you make bloody sure you do. I do not care what I do to myself. I do not, George. Ha. Let's peel open our brains, find the soul itself. Let's blast ourselves with electrical force, turn ourselves inside out to find out what we are, what we can be. <laughs> that is what poets must do. I declare I am a public enemy of kingly death, false beauty and decay. Bitch, sit down, you maniac. There are waves breaking over our gunnel. It's no good, Claire. You know it. We will go back to England. No! We'll stay here. Summer will never end. I won't let it. Reach out and hold it. Pull it back. Summer is over. Byron's new poem is finished and copied by us. He wants Bish to take it back to England for its publication. <gasps> I tell you, when Lord Byron finishes a new poem, Summer is truly done for. What shall I do? Where shall I... Live with us. We will find a small house with a garden. Be quiet. You will have your child. I will not have her called Augusta. I will not. Will not. Here! You have your adventure, sir. We'll have to swim for it. Come! The boat is lost. Dive in, sir. No! When will the world marry itself? When will the true family be all of human society? I write poems, but most of the world cannot even read. So what can I do? Act as if I were free. Write as if I were free. The boat is lost! I'm inside! Swim! Cannot swim! Cannot you swim! You can't lie to me, sir! Venturing in a frail boat in bad weather! Cannot! Sinking down! Of song! Oh, damnation then! I will have to stay and hang on with you! Oh, God! <laughs> will you do anything, my dear Shelley, to create an heroic episode? <sighs> you are unharmed, my lord! Lord, the boat was done for. <laughs> Mary, your husband, 
clings onto it like a leech, announces he cannot swim, that he'll go down with it, then Danwell sails it head on into the waves and saves us both. Mary, I, uh... What were you thinking? <laughs> Maybe it was not as bad as all that, but... Come, my loves, my dears. Clean clothes, brandy, refreshments, talk. And then, then we'll retire to colour up the incident in our diaries. All is well, all is well. All is well. A month ago. How can that be? She drowned, and I was not told. Oh, the circumstances. Hyde Park, that filthy, filthy lake, and... and... Pregnant. Bad news. On a dull afternoon in a cold, wet garden in England. I but wrote a casual inquiry to Hookham. Oh, dear Hookham. How, by the way, is Harriet, my wife, and my two children? And back comes the reply, oh, she drowned herself a month ago. <laughs> he says it was even reported in the Times. Found drowned. Found drowned. We must not. Not what? Tell you what we must do. Take out an order for the Times. I should study the reactionary press more. Then I will learn of the death of those I love. We must be careful because of this terrible news. Careful of ourselves. Do you also see from the letter I have received a good review in the examiner? True, written by Lee Hunt, a good friend of mine, therefore corrupt. But a good review. What news? A good review and the death of my wife. Is not life full and wild and a glory and... Stop it! You indulge yourself. Indeed. Look, I was going to make a fire for our little William and Clara in the woods and roast chestnuts and tell them stories from the flames of spirits and make them laugh and wonder. It is Harriet's family behind this. They did not tell me so my silence would appear horrible. Why? They want the children. The devil. Why cannot our children live with Harriet's? Why cannot I have two families or three or four? What in nature forbids it? Ah, English bourgeois morality forbids it. I am cast as a monster. I too. Throw in rags. I... I have come to the conclusion that there must be a revolution in England. I write for it every morning. I am... And my wife is dead. <laughs> And my children stolen, and Byron's mistress is about to have her child in my house. House I live in with my mistress and our children. Scandal, scandal, tittle-tattle. And in Ireland, English soldiers are murdering Irish liberty. And in my garden, neighbors peer over the fence, hoping to see me and Mary and Claire all naked. Claire with her big belly rolling in the cabbage patch. Quick, quick. Inform the Daily Mail. In the foreign wars of liberation, as we agonize about who sleeps with whom, heroes scream under the torturers and children pass their mothers and fathers the gun. Oh, oh, all is hysteria, is it not, my love? No. It is just the world. Just the world. Well, England, you neighbors, police committees, censors, you... Tatters, you indignant dignitaries, parliamentaries, thin-lipped peddlers of smug moralities, I give you what you want. Here in rags is the life we libertarians lead. Come, wipe your assholes. Be satisfied. Be justified. Be smug. I have my dead, but you have yours. Mine, I will grieve for, suffer the wrongs I did them in private measure. But you, you great English bourgeois public, your dead are at large. You pass them every day in the dirty streets of Manchester, of Birmingham, of London. My ghosts will sing to me, but yours... We'll bury you. Hey? 
No, my dear. Hey. What sentiments from filthy private things to sedition against my country? Do you think it took her long? It's not that deep, the Serpentine. Took the children boating on it once, only two, three feet deep, the Serpentine. It's deep. It? I will not have you, and I will not have myself condemned to this raving in an English garden. I will not have it. We have done nothing wrong. Harriet was a fool to drown herself. Now that she is dead, we can get married. Then uproot ourselves, plant ourselves abroad, out of this English garden, English graveyard. If we marry, the courts will give us your children. Harriet's children? Children belong to no one but themselves, as you have often said. Neither of us believes in marriage. You have married once already. But... But... I have no defense. You married Harriet Westbrook. You were both very young. I want you to marry me. It is a practical matter. We must move through the world, armed as best we can be. You are very cold. You are very callous. Why callous? Why cold? My darling, well, I receive news of the death of my wife, and you propose to me. I mean, are we... Really going to live this? There lies your callousness, sir. For I live in your household, sir. Do not curtsy like that. Do not. I... I, 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 yes, sir. Stop it. Now, you, you, stop it. Light the fire. Let the little demons dance, eh? You're retreating into poetic imagery again, darling. Will you marry me? Yes! Will you marry me? Don't! No! <sighs> Mary, Mary, you are so fantastical, so daring that I am ashamed. I quote, my spirit like a burning bark doth swim upon the liquid waves of thy sweet singing, blazing into the regions dim of rapture, with sails of fire winging its way adown your many winding river. Madam, you have been reading my notebook. The bloody poem's about Claire, isn't it? You have somewhat embellished it, the quotation. Oh, come on, come on. You wrote it two weeks ago, after Claire sang us Mozart, and three nights ago you told me you wanted to sit up and write. Don't think you were a writing, my dear. You were going adown Claire's many a winding river. In your boat. No? Yes. 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 You were. Yes, I. The song you wrote, Claire, is very beautiful. As beautiful as her singing. Will you marry me? Yes. Are you going to build the fire for William and Clara in the woods? I must. I've made up a story for them. Light the fire, tell it to them. Make up demons, then come into the house and have tea. Hot cakes? Yes. 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 After all, somehow we are going to have to domesticate all these grand passions. Yes. Yes. I'll file a suit for Harriet's children in the Court of Chancery, little Charles and Xanthi. Yes. You and I will bring them up with our children. Yes. We will be one great family. And thus, kind sir, we will flourish. The fire, the children's story. Oh, uh, yes. <coughs> the words. Oh, you can do the words, can't you, Bish? Quote. Never will peace and human nature meet Till free and equal man and woman greet Domestic peace And ere this power can make in human hearts Its calm and holy seat This slavery must be broken Now how about doing the life? Kind Kind, sir Dover Beach, waiting for the packet boat to cross to Calais. And I see them. The Shelley menagerie. Women, children, bags of seditious material fleeing the country. 
No good dame gossip doth say that the Clare Claremont woman gave birth to a child of my lord Byron's, and the great lord has taken the child off from the mother. Yes. And all were scandalised by the Mary Godwin woman marrying Shelley and trying to steal away the children of his first marriage to bring them up atheist. But the court upheld morality and said no. These people, am I condemned to be the nobody at their feast? I will not make myself known. I will dog them. Send back tasty bits to the literary magazines. The Shelleys shall belong to me. And now they lie in the sun in their rented villa, the Casa Bertini in the Apennine Mountains. I mingle with the tourists, look over the wall, whisper in the town. They are the creatures of Lord Byron, the rake, all of them, even Shelley. He is translating Plato's filthy work, advocating the love of men for boys. Whisper, scandal, sweet, sweet. You are both utterly, 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 totally and absurdly wrong. Oh. Oh. <laughs> it is always a very bad idea for lovers to start talking about what love is. <laughs> All I am saying is that we need a theory of the emotions. Why? Do we need a theory of breathing? If we did, with all the thinking on it, I believe we would choke. Love is the lineaments of gratified desire. What? What? A line by William Blake. Oh, that religious madman. A good line. It means that love can be anything. It shapes itself around the desire of the moment. Plato? Yes. What does Plato say love is, Bish? You're just dying to get him into the <sighs> argument. <laughs> the argument between Diotima and Socrates, which proves that love is not a divine god. Shall we do it? Plato's symposium <laughs> in the garden. What of the tourists? I will warn them. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> love is not a god. The Greeks did it with boys. <laughs> Observe, then, that you do not consider love to be a god. What, then? Is love a mortal? By no means. But what, then? He is neither mortal nor immortal, but something intermediate. What is that, oh dear Tima? A great demon, Socrates. He communicates between the divine and the human by science of sacred things. Sacrifices and expiations and disenchantments, mm. prophecy and magic. Mm. That is his demonical nature. Not a god, not a man, not a woman, mm. not a child, a demon. Demon? A force that flies between us. There. 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 <sighs> I must go to Venice, Mary. Bish. We have not heard of Allegra with Byron. I know he means to send for me. I am worried about this constant travelling. Little Clara is not strong, Bish. Then... My darlings, I must be with him. Oh, why can't we all be together as we were in Switzerland? That was a golden age. Not really so golden, Claire, remember. But we are all married to each other, is that not true? Plato's demon. <laughs> Hasn't he run rings round all of us? I'll go. Alone. I'll go with Claire. Oh, yes. We must bring George Byron to heel. He is behaving disgracefully. I'll go with Claire to Venice. I'll see him alone and tell him what must be. He will tell Byron. We must be practical. What we want to live, we must make it. I see. Well, very well. You and Claire will go to Venice and I will stay here and look after the children. Fine. We owe it to Claire, to Allegra. Oh, we do. Mary, please. We were happy here. 
This will take but a few days, a week. Fragile. I fear something could break so easily, so casually, without us hardly noticing. Yes, a little holiday in the Italian sun, tracking down the literati, keeping track of their little affairs, their little sorrows. What greater delight, what better amusement. I wish I was death. I would give them all a disease. They would hate me then, not ignore me, not spin their new love, their new world. They must not win. I could not stand it. George Byron, I stand a petitioner in your marbled halls. <laughs> my dear Bish! <laughs> Have my footman not brought you a drink? Carrot juice or something? The buggers are all drunk, no doubt, and it's only breakfast time. It is four o'clock in the afternoon, George. Yes, 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 but I've finally gone day into night, night into day. Have you had a married woman in Venice yet? We... I, I only arrived this morning. <laughs> you damn revolutionist carrot juice drinker. I am so glad to see you. <laughs> uh, f forgive me, yes, I... Stink of garlic, and my my teeth are no better. And I had a particularly vicious clap last winter, nearly over that now, thank God. And my hair goes grey, would die it, but I keep on getting pissed and falling in damn canals. <laughs> and how are you, my dear? In love. I have translated Plato's Symposium. Not coming round to boys at last, are you? Copy, copy. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> For you. A delight. A delight. Nothing else for me out of the rotting north, the armed camp, the turgid cesspool. I mean England. No. I did think perhaps you had letters from Augusta. No matter. <laughs> All that is dead. In a dead country we are in the wide world now, though... Beware, revolutionary. Venice, too, is an armed camp. Austrian soldiers and spies everywhere. The city mm. is not the cradle of civilization. Art and light we dream of. <laughs> it rots. There is clandestine opposition. I do what I can. I flirt with it. Uh, is Italian liberty your cause? Liberty everywhere. <laughs> Always the abstract. The real thing in Italy is cash is of outdated weapons, forever being turned over by police, small meetings, infiltrated and betrayed, young men and women being beaten to shit in jail. You want to get involved, I can introduce you to some people. Poor Venice. A prison and a brothel. We noticed. Ah, we. Come on, do not stand there so damn angelic. Who are you with? Who are you having? I came with Claire. She did your fair copy of the symposium. No, oh, that bitch was always good when one wanted something copied out. That damn bitch! She... <laughs> she was... I, I shock you. Do not let this come between us, bitch. I will have none of it. I am a go-between. Nothing to go between. The child? My daughter, Allegra, is with me. And that is an end to it. I will have her sent to a convent with a school. I have found the place. Is that what you wish me to tell? I wish you to tell my daughter's mother. <laughs> Everything or, or nothing. What do I care? You are harsh. That is how it is. You reproach me. No. Damnation. Damnation. I know what you did for me. That she had the child in your house. That you give her a roof. But... <laughs> I have no endurance of these things, Bish. No endurance at all. It... It is not my behaviour that gives me pause. It is yours, my dear. Why mine? <laughs> A little flicker of English puritanism there. You do reproach me. <laughs> no matter, your friendship is precious. Come, we will go out. I want to take you somewhere and show you something. And so, o'er the lagoon we glided, and from that funereal bark, 
I leaned and saw the city, and could mark how from their many aisles in the evening's gleam its temples and its palaces did seem like fabrics of enchantment piled to heaven. <laughs> you poor sod. <laughs> you believe in love. You do, you poor bastard. Yet you harm as many as I, you would-be moral immoralist. A wife drowned in the serpentine. And who was that other little thing in London? Uh, overdosed herself with opium because of you. Oh, yes, the, the appropriately named Fanny Godwin. Your second wife's little sister. All of 15, wasn't she, when you had her? I cannot be... Cannot be what? Responsible? <laughs> My darling, darling hypocrite. <laughs> What a pity it is that you are not turned the other way, too, as I am. We could marry, become two harmless old men, arm in arm on the seashore, writing verse in peace, retired from this seething, organic world of flux and blood and manic husbands and jealousy, huh? <laughs> Do you know where I found myself one night last week? Halfway up a drain pipe to the balcony of an 18-year-old heiress. Dangling in mid-air, do you know what happened to me? The drain pipe gave way. Worse. Chest pain. Worse. I looked down into the street, and there, dressed for the opera, was the Venetian correspondent for the London Daily Mail. Ah, oh, spotted! And then... But what? Did you go up to love the heiress or down to thrash the journalist? <laughs> then, uh, well, for a moment, both delights had an equal attraction. No. I despaired. Come, come. No, no. Despair. Up a drain pipe. A good story. Is it not? Is it not? <laughs> Actually, I went down and bribed the spy to silence. Now, is that within my received character, yes or no? No. No. Oh. Then believe what I say, you tight-ass, libertarian, free-lover, free-liver. What are you telling me? You went home, reformed? Not at all. <laughs> Waited till the spy was well away, then went to the servant's door, another bribe, and... Up to her. Sweet thing. Fair hair. I'm not telling you that I've reformed. I'm telling you that I have despaired. What right do you have to do that? You do not have the right. Despair? Easy, George. Cheap merchandise for a writer. You will end up silent or making a pretty lyric out of the phrase, I have nothing to say. The people of England, they may well have the right to despair. So would you, if you were a mill hand in Manchester, or a child down a mine, or a mother to a labourer's children in a filthy hovel. Perish the thought. Or for a poet to despair, obscene. We claim to be the poets of the people of England. How dare we luxuriate in denouncing the human cause as lost? The great instrument of moral good is the imagination. We must not let it become diseased. We must be optimists for human nature. We might be all we dream of, happy, high, majestical. Where is the love, beauty and truth we seek but in our mind? Poets are the unacknowledged legislators of mankind. You talk utopia. <clears throat> we are where I want to take you. Come on, dreamer. What is this island? A madhouse, Bish. Come on. <laughs> Come on. I want you to meet a true citizen of the world. The oozy stairs into an old courtyard. Black bars. A face looking down. Hair of weeds. The intendant took us into that terrible place. The madman sat by a window. He said, I met... Pale pain, my, my shadow. shadow. How vain are words. <laughs> oh, from my pen the words flow as I write, dazzling my eyes with scalding tears. What I write burns the brain and eats into it. <laughs> sir, sir, kind sir, you have a... Childish face, sir, sir, a rhyme. 
of the fate of poets. Most wretched creatures. They are cradled into poetry by a wrong. They learn in suffering what they teach in song. <laughs> See, my dear? A poet in an asylum. Is he not a lesson to us all? <laughs> a sweet irony, no bish. You write to change the world. And the world has its revenge. It overwhelms you with its cruelty. <laughs> <laughs> Why did he take me there? A joke? A warning? A... Uh, what of Allegra? What haven't you told me? Byron is putting Allegra in a convent with a school. Oh, no. He can. He's her father. Oh, no. He has the right. No. I'll go to him. I'll dance naked for him. Any filthy thing he wants, I'll... Not! No, I will not be diminished by this, by... by the cruelty of a lord. From now on, I will look to myself. Yes. <sighs> we will conquer our fears. I will have nothing of madmen. Poetic indulgence, I will see the real world. <gasps> I can see it. St. Peter's Field. The outskirts of Manchester, a great crowd. Some 60,000 working men and women, armed only with banners. And then, from nowhere, a militia. A brutal attack. In ten minutes, a massacre. Eleven dead, 421 cases of serious injury, 162 men, women and children with sabre wounds. And where was I? The poet, impotent in Italy, in the sun. The world is catching fire. The oppressors have bloodied their hands. But what excites the educated classes? The behaviour of the rich and famous in bed. Bish, it would be better if you did not talk, not now. Why? What's the matter? What, is little Clara worse? It's nothing. A stomach upset, a cold on her chest. She's a child of the new age. The dear little ones, they will have to be tough as steel. Soldiers for what is coming. Be quiet. Be quiet. Can't you tell what has happened? Are you so insensitive? Isn't it screaming off us? Your daughter died an hour ago while you were out in the street. Oh. Oh, a little cold and we are in Venice. A city of the rich, of hypochondriacs, of art and science and light. There are legions of doctors in this rotting hell. Go out, get medicine for a little child with a bad tummy. Let me hit him in the face. Let me pull out his hair, scratch out his eyes. No, Mary, stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Go and see her. Kiss her. Breathe life back. You will stay where you are. You will keep away. You will be still. Utterly still. It was you who made me bring her to Venice. The cruelest thing you have done to me. Impossible, impossible journey with a sick child. There was nothing impossible about it. I drew up a timetable for the family, the servants. You had only to keep to it. It was all absolutely clear. There was no reason for anything to go wrong. You accuse me? Do you come into this hotel room? Dreary, dreary hotel room. Find your daughter dead and accuse me? Yes, you... Desiccated with it, bitch! Yes, I... I... No, of course, I do not accuse you. I am glad to hear it. For I do accuse you. It, it's the grief. Only the grief talking. Please, my love. Accuse you for the cruelty, pointless cruelty of all your schemes. The endless madcap journeys in the heat in dirty coaches. The endless, hopeless schemes and dreams and... What have you achieved, Bish? <laughs> I have written... of the Peterloo Massacre. I have written The Mask of Anarchy. Let it be a poem 
for our daughter. Oh, can't you hear yourself? Do you know what you're saying? Is the, the price of a poem the death of our child? The Mosque of Anarchy. No one will publish it. Will Hunt and the Examiner? No. He knows he will go to jail for seditious libel. <laughs> the great revolutionary English poem, unpublishable. Bury it in your daughter's coffin, poet. We do what we can. <sighs> I write what I can. I... At the massacre, they carried the word love on a banner. Oh, yes, put the word love on a banner, put the word life on a banner. But we are still in love. We all are with each other. The sorrow of this will bind us together. Yes. All still. Yes. Newspaper, yes. Run and written by us. A voice in England, radical, fierce, uncompromising. With wonderful reviews of our own work, no doubt. It will be a banner, a beacon. <laughs> that is why I've asked Lee Hunt to come out and join us. The worthy, boring Lee Hunt. I see you're as hot as ever, my dear. Look at our two boats moored up together. Do you think the Bolivar is ostentatious? Highly, George. Good. You admire the brass cannons? Do they work? Work? What does that matter? <laughs> Do you like the moulding on the prow? Does it not make the boat look more fearsome? It is all excellent, George. As for your boat, is she not shallow in the water? How could a boat named the Don Juan be shallow? Cutting, cutting, sir. It was damn flattered you named her after my poem. I do not object to plagiarism when it flatters. I'm thinking of renaming her the Ariel. Yes, more airy fairy, more like you. Your women. Walking on the beach, I see. Still the same menagerie. How is she? Claire. You know whom I mean. Changed. Well, different. Much. What? After... Come, George. They've both had children by us who died in this country. It's not like you to flinch from raising the subject. Allegra. That damn convent. I felt like breaking in, shooting nuns left, right and centre. And your wife? You know she miscarried a child two months ago. Hey, God. Two men together, two women together on a beach, but, but, but. <sighs> we have not met enough, Bish. What have we done for three years? Barged about this bloody country, you with your holy family, I with my whores. I'm thinking of going to Mexico. There's a revolutionary war there. Or Greece, though the Greek clap would be just about the worst in the world, as I well remember. But all this writing about tyranny, huh? In the end, you get itchy fingers, violent verses, pale. You want to actually put a bullet in a fat neck. My dear Mary. My lord. And Claire, will you not greet me? Well? Shall we all dance upon the beach again, my loves? Shall we send up Shellian balloons loaded with lightning experiments? Steal some fire, shall we, huh? Forgive me. I'm not too well today, my lord. A war. If only there are a war in England, not that endless, slow, sullen defeat. Why don't the bastards take up arms against such a government? Then we poets would be of some use. We'd do the songs, the banners, the shouts. But no. Sullen silence. Is Williams down there re-rigging your boat? I want it to sail faster. Ha! I will race your Bolivar to Livorno when we go to pick up the hunts. Oh, the hunts. Those bloody children. Why do these well-meaning literati have so many of them? All so healthy and so... Ugh. 
I am so damn restless. Well, well. Let's go play with our boats like good little boys. Well? Do you know that is the first time I've seen him since our daughter died? Is that not terrible or farcical? He looks crabbed, much older. What of the plans with the hunts, Fish? We will sail both vessels to Livorno. You stay here. We will bring the hunts if things can be made quiet between them and George. Why cannot they come over land? We will sail. Jane Williams would very much like to sail, perhaps. Yes, Jane Williams. What is the matter? What can be the matter? Williams is re-rigging for me. I must go and help. We are well. It will be fun. Jane Williams, his boatman's wife. Have you not listened to the pretty little love lyrics being read each night after supper as if out of thin air? <laughs> and I have found the manuscript of the new long poem he is writing. At the bottom of the page, in tiny, tiny writing, were the words, Alas, I kiss you, Jane. Not to be diminished. I will join the subterranean community of women. Travel. I'll see islands and the snows of Russia. I will never marry, for I was married once. To you, Mary. And to him. Do you know what the new poem is called? No. Yes. How can I? Guess, guess, guess. Mary, stop it. It is called The Triumph of Life. <laughs> the triumph of life. <laughs> the triumph of life. <laughs> oh, yes, I knew Shelley and Venice well. Oh, yes, many an evening went to brothels together, talking literature the while. <laughs> Oh, yes, Shelley's mistress, other than myself. Oh, yes, yes. Of course, I was the model for the diabolical in Mary's novel. Gave her the plot for the damn book. <laughs> well, not quite, but to all intents and purposes. I saw Bish Shelley jump into his boat in Livorno Harbour with the storm coming. My opinion? Suicide. Yes, no doubt. Of course... You know about the body when it washed up. The fish had had the eyes out and eaten the testicles. As I lay asleep in Italy, there came a voice from over the sea, and with great power it forth led me to walk in the visions of poetry. I met murder on the way. He had a mask like Castle Ray. Very smooth he looked, yet grim. Seven bloodhounds followed him. All were fat, and well they might be an admirable plight. For one by one and two by two, he tossed them human hearts to chew, which from his wide cloak he drew. And with pomp to meet him came, clothed in arms like blood and flame, the hired murderers who did sing, did sing. Did sing, did sing. And anarchy. The ghastly birth lay dead earth upon the earth. The horse of death, tameless as wind, fled, and with his hooves did grind to dust the murderers thronged behind. A rushing light of clouds and splendor, a sense awakening yet tender, was heard and felt, and at its close, words of joy and fear arose. Men of England, heirs of glory, Heroes of unwritten story, nurslings of one mighty mother, hopes of her and one another, rise like lions after slumber in unvanquishable number. Shake your chains to earth like dew, which in sleep had fallen on you. Ye are many, they are few. The waters are flashing. The white hail is dashing, the lightnings are glancing, the horse spray is dancing. The earth is like ocean, wreck strewn and in motion. Bird, beast, man and worm have crept out of the storm. And fearest thou, and fearest thou, and 
and seest thou, and hearest thou, and drive we not free over the terrible sea, I and thou. Mother of many acts and hours, free the serpent. These are the spells by which to reassume an empire or the disentangled doom to suffer. Woes which hope thinks infinite to forgive wrongs darker than death or night to defy power which seems omnipotent. To love and bear. To hope till hope creates from its own wreck the thing it contemplates. This is to be good, great and joyous, beautiful and free. Voluptuous flight. Voluptuous flight. <laughs> An easy rhyme there with night. We'll burn the body on the beach. I loved him. Thus is another man gone about whom the world was brutally mistaken. And in the name of all the mercies, look what the sea did to its flesh. Burn him! Burn him! Burn him! Burn us all! A great big, bloody, beautiful fire! In Bloody Poetry, Percy Bysshe Shelley was played by Oliver Ryan and George Byron by Patrick Kennedy. Mary Shelley was Claire Corbett. Claire Claremont was Sarah Ovens and William Polidori was Gareth Pierce. Bloody Poetry was written by Howard Brenton and adapted and directed for radio by Alison Hindle.